All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Archaeology Abridged. I'm Ben Thomas, AIA's Director of Programs. Before we get to our speaker, I just have a couple things that I wanted to mention. Um, let's actually use slides for this. We are recording this event and we'll make it available on our YouTube channel, but we ask that you please don't make any personal recordings of the presentation. The talk will be followed by time for Q&A, uh, but just so that we can get to your questions, please put your questions in the Q&A window uh, and not in the chat. It kind of gets lost uh, with all the other chats, all the other comments that are in there. So just put it separately in the Q&A window. All AIA programs are supported by our members and donors. So if you're interested in supporting the AIA, please text GIVE to 833-965-2840 or visit us at archaeological.org slash donate. To become a member of the AIA, go to archaeological.org slash join. And as you can see, we do have ASL interpretation uh, for this talk. Uh, you can also do closed captioning uh, and you just have to turn that on on your own machine. It's under, I think under more, uh, there should be a way to turn on. I think it says show full transcript and that uh, should give you Closed captioning if you if you want that. Okay, we're joined today by Heather McKillop. Heather McKillop has been working in the Maya area and in Belize since 1979. Her work has focused on the ancient Maya economy and on salt. Heather is interested in how salt was produced, how the labor for salt production was organized, and how uh, the salt producers supplied the needs of the nearby inland Maya uh, for a fairly scarce commodity. She has focused on the Paynes Creek salt works in Belize since the 2004 discovery of the only known ancient Maya canoe paddle and wooden buildings preserved in mangrove peat below the seafloor, a project for which she received an AIA site preservation grant to help with the preservation of the site and the artifacts. And that's what we're gonna hear more about today, these incredible discoveries. Heather is the Thomas and Lillian Landrum Alumni Professor in the Department of Geography and Anthropology at Louisiana State University. She is a 2020 recipient of the Research Master Award in the Humanities and Social, Science, and Social Sciences at LSU. Her many publications include Maya Salt Works, In Search of Maya Sea Traders, and Salt, White Gold of the Ancient Maya. She was interviewed on NPR's Science Friday, and we actually have a link of, uh, to the interview on our website, so check that out after this talk. Her current National Science Foundation grant with Dr. E. Corey Sills will support the excavation of multiple buildings at large underwater sites to identify salt kitchens, residences, and the organization of production. I just found out from Heather that she will indeed be able to go down to the field to Belize uh, this season, uh, after about two years of not being able to do field work. So that's great news. Heather, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Ben, for that uh, uh, great introduction. And yes, uh, our whole team uh, is going. I'm going to be leaving in a couple of weeks, and uh, the rest of the team joining shortly after. We're really excited because it's been three years since we've been able to do field work. Okay. Uh, but uh, I'll uh, share my. Yeah, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Heather, and then turn off my camera and I'll come back on after for the QA. Okay. Thanks everyone for coming today. Um, I'm really honored and excited to be able to share 
the results of some of our work uh, with you today. And the second part, I'll be talking more about the site preservation grant and our 3D digital imaging. That'll be May 19th on Zoom uh, through the AIA website, the second part of Archaeology Abridged. Um, today, I'm going to talk about discovered ancient Maya wooden buildings underwater in Belize. For many years, I've been carrying out research with permits uh, generously given from the Belize Institute of Archaeology and funding from various sources um, in the coastal waters in southern Belize. Uh, I started at Wild Cane Key, where I did my dissertation work. I've also excavated at uh, Frenchman's Key and other places on islands on the mainland. And as Ben said, since 2004, uh, we've been really focused on Haynes Creek National Park in the water in Punta Cacas Lagoon, a large salt, saltwater lagoon system. Because uh, in uh, previously, I had uh, discovered three sites in the water, one of them, Stingray Lagoon site, 300 meters from the closest shore. So we knew that it hadn't eroded, it was an in situ deposit. And I published the, uh, the results of the analysis of the artifacts and the excavation in my book, Salt, White Gold of the Ancient Maya, 2002, University Press of Florida. And what we were doing uh, was excavating bricotage, which you see in the bottom corner of the screen, broken bits of salt boiling pots. This is a process of boiling brine in pots over fires that's very common um, throughout the world uh, and is used in places like Southern Belize um, in antiquity where it's, it rains a lot and you don't have nice white sandy beaches, you have uh, mangrove, classic mangrove ecosystem. In my salt book, uh, I described the artifacts and the excavations, and we found this bricotage. In my conversations with colleagues, particularly Tony Andrews, he said, yeah, but three sites isn't going to do much to supply the inland Maya. And I realized he was right. And so I, I wanted to um, find if there were more sites than three sites. Uh, this Artist reconstruction from Science et Avenir, a French magazine, of the boiling process is really very accurate in terms of the pots. But as you'll see, uh, it wasn't a kind of a beach party outdoor picnic. It was really very organized on a massive scale. The model that we're using is from Sacapulas, Guatemala, where they're boiling brine from a salt spring. And here you see some images from a 1981 publication in Expedition magazine by Raina and Monaghan, which is really good description and images where they have a family salt kitchens where the focused activity is making salt by the brine boiling process. They live elsewhere in the community farther back from the salt springs. <clears throat> and here you see a family uh, pouring brine into the pots while they're boiling over a fire. And then on the right-hand side, you see where they've got salt cakes, which are, you turn the, the pots over and you harden them and then you break the pots and, and you see that. So in 2004, I finally got a sabbatical and a faculty research grant from LSU, an incentive grant to go back and see if there were more salt making sites. With the funds, I was able to hire someone with a fast boat where I could actually uh, get to the lagoon and back to town in one day and do field work better than me driving a motorized dugout canoe and having to take camping gear and camp out. So <clears throat> we started doing pedestrian survey. And here you see my boat driver and I in the water and some of the artifacts that we 
we were looking for as we walked in rubber boots with sun hats and bathing suits through the water, uh, looking for sites, sometimes actually stumbling on them. But you can see here that, uh, and here's a little bit more organized pedestrian survey in the lagoon. Here's my boat driver, Jackie, obviously more than a boat driver. He's an essential part of the team. Uh, and look at the size of that pot shirt. There was no post-depositional trampling on the sites afterwards. So we have large pieces of pottery and also they're pre-washed. So there's an advantage, we can see them. So we don't actually go on the land. We focused our research in the water. In 2004, we made an unexpected discovery. We found wooden building posts, as you see here with sharpened ends, they look fresh and the, uh, many of them have bark on them and one end is sharpened. Uh, they barely protrude uh, above the sea floor. And in fact, I really didn't think that they were actual wooden building posts. We were walking through a mangrove swamp and in swamps, there's lots of posts. And so finally I said, okay, we're gonna excavate one of these. And we were poorly equipped for excavating, but we did take turns holding our breath, diving down and digging around one of these so-called posts until it was finally freed and we raised it and it came up out of the water and about a meter and it was straight like a post and the other the bottom end was sharpened like a post and i said it's a post and then everyone turned to me and said so what are these and i said well salt sheds and i think i that was you know i'm in charge so i have to make some determination but now we call them salt kitchens and they're very common now, the significance of this is wood doesn't normally preserve in the tropical landscape of the Maya area, except in unusual conditions. So we had one of those unusual conditions that I will um, describe more fully in a minute. But let's look at the posts in more detail. The one horizontally held by my team members uh, is the very first post we found. And look at how straight it is. The jagged end is where it barely protruded above the seafloor and a slightly sharpened other end and straight. And we took a sample out of it for radiocarbon dating, a nice sharpened end. On a good day, this is what we might see, a post on the sea floor, but they're very hard to find. And I wondered, this was site 15 that we had found uh, so far that year in 2004. What about site 14 and the other sites that we'd found? What about the sites in my salt book? Uh, well, we eventually got back to all of those, including the ones in my salt book, and there were posts everywhere. We hadn't noticed them. Well, it says something about the nature of scientific discovery, I think, in terms of how, um, how new discoveries are, are made, because we were not expecting to find them, and so we weren't looking for them. But in our um, in our favor, I think was that um, you know this was we didn't realize the good preservation conditions that we had. We found two kinds of posts. In general, we found hardwood posts, even with bark, like you see here, They're perfectly preserved, although salt waterlogged, and which presented a conservation nightmare. And palmetto palm posts as you see here held by one of my team members, Amanda Evans. These are water resistant. They're often used to shore up the sides of, of seawalls or airstrips as in Belize today. We took radiocarbon samples. They were dated from the late classic to the terminal classic. So they're ancient, even though they don't look very old at all. Um, the significance, Wooden buildings were probably common at ancient Maya communities as they are today in traditional Maya villages for houses, workshops, storage, and other uses. Even William Haviland in his work at Tikal on stone buildings and houses um, remarked that they weren't finding um, all of the buildings. And here you see the modern village of San Pedro Colombia in Southern Belize 
And all of the buildings are pole and thatch, at least they were when I took this photo, uh, except a, a stone church. And then uh, a photo from the Robert C. West photo archives, courtesy of the LSU Cartographic Information Center, where you see pole uh, buildings, pole walls, and the thatch roof. Well, we did go back to site 14 and the other sites. And at site 14, as Ben noticed, we found uh, the first and only ancient Maya wooden canoe paddle, a full size, four foot seven inch, uh, determined later uh, to be made from sapodilla wood. And it was preserved in red mangrove peat below the seafloor. You can see where it barely protruded above the seafloor is kind of worm eaten. And one side of the blade is actually broken off. So initially we thought it looked like the paddler gods on the carved bones from Burial 116, Temple 1 from Tikal, which appear to show paddlers with a paddling uh, with a blade on one side. But of course, they weren't paddling in the water. Uh, and they were holding the paddle in a kind of strange way, too. So Site 14 got a fancy name, Kaknab, uh, because it's so special. You can follow this up. It's, the article is uh, available now uh, freely online. Uh, you can look in PNAS 2005 or put my name in and you'll find it. Um, we also found a rosewood handle with a jadeite gouge. The significance of this, this was later, much later in 2007. Uh, wooden handles or other wooden objects are rarely preserved in the Maya area, just like the wooden posts. Uh, the jadeite is really a beautiful green color and it's 98 percent pure jadeite, which makes it a durable tool, according to my colleague, George Harlow, who's the leading world expert in jadeite and a co-author on the article that we published in Antiquity, which you can also see it's, it's open access online. But he said the jadeite was uh, the green translucent color was due to the tightly woven um, grain in the jadeite made it as particularly durable and it perfectly fit uh, the wooden handle. My boat driver Jackie found it while cleaning around um, a post when he and I were sampling side by side uh, with large kitchen knives underwater sampling posts and uh, it was pretty spectacular. Now why was all this wood preserved. It was preserved because of the mangrove peat, which is very organic and lacks oxygen. Red mangrove peat is deposited as the red mangroves grow taller um, to keep their leaves above the water as sea level rises. So red mangrove peat is a proxy for sea level rise. Here you see LSU graduate Jessica Harrison excavating a peat block. She's holding it on a knife. So it's a very durable, solid material. So the material was not moving, that was embedded in the seafloor. Here's a profile of the sediment column we took and you, we burned the sediment to see how organic it was, to demonstrate it to our colleagues. It's highly organic. We also took samples from each level to identify the species, which is red mangrove, fine mangrove roots mainly. So this is um, sea level research, sea level rise research. And we have at least four meters of mangrove peat identified um, the last 4,000 years. So after all this, I realized we couldn't continue to walk on the sea floor and damage the wooden architecture and we also, with every step we took, we stirred up the silt on the sea floor. So I wanted to get away from uh, the sea floor. So we have a new field project. Uh, I had um, NSF funding for mapping ancient Maya wooden buildings below the sea floor, Belize. The goals were to find underwater sites with wooden structures to map them and to date them. And here you see uh, the team modified pedestrian survey 
using research flotation devices, RFDs, all lined up. And here you see the team in the water floating slowly, shoulder by shoulder, and finding things. And look how happy they are. Wouldn't you be happy if you're doing archaeological research in the Caribbean and finding wooden architecture? I'm not in the picture because I'm taking the photographs. And there's um, Jackie uh, flight with some flags. Uh, so we use survey flags, or in deep water, we used fish floats attached to fishing line and skewered in wire on the seafloor and labeled, as you see here, um, and then map them. And here's former doctoral student, now graduate, um, Breton Summers holding the prism pole on top of one of the posts. We individually mapped the posts and we individually mapped diagnostic artifacts uh, that were associated with them and produced uh, GIS maps because we can't see anything really from looking above the water uh, at the flags. They give us an impression, but not the pattern. We found a total of, and mapped, individually mapped, 4,042 posts at 70 sites. Uh, the, the details of this are in my Maya Saltworks book, 2009, from University Press of Florida. Uh, the posts included 2,439 vertical hardwood posts, such as you see here, 1,482 vertical palmetto palm posts, uh, some horizontal hardwood and horizontal palmetto palm posts. We didn't map all of them. And some hardwood wedges. If you're a camper, you know that if you want to keep your tent poles straight, you often use wedges around them. So some of the sites had wedges. Uh, posts were not mapped at 30 sites that were either in water that was too deep or uh, too remote for a total station mapping. And posts were not found at seven sites. Uh, we've pretty much systematically surveyed shoulder to shoulder on our RFDs, most of the lagoon system. So what is a site? Here is part of the Western Lagoon. Uh, it's a very small part of it, but you, you, this is a GIS map that shows the uh, distribution of the posts, not the artifacts on this one, but you see the brown dots are the hardwood posts and the gray X's are the palmetto palms, which are often at the edge of the distribution of the, of the artifacts at these clusters. So I defined a site as a cluster of wooden posts protruding from the seafloor and associated artifacts separated by at least 10 meters from another cluster. We had a lot of discussions during field work about, well, about food, but also about uh, what is the site. And for example, I included all of this as site 72. Well, I think a lot of this had been, mangrove had grown over this. And so I was, getting away from the actual definition that I had produced. But um, anyway, uh, since we recorded at the individual post and individual artifact level, <clears throat> we could also vary how we put sites together or not. So I think we were okay. Um, so we have a new project, as uh, Ben said, and, and um, I mentioned at the beginning, we're gonna be starting in a couple of weeks. Um, I've got a former PhD graduate from LSU, now associate professor at UT Tyler, Dr. Corey Sills and I have a new NSF project and we're taking a, a big team of current and former graduate students uh, to excavate, hopefully at Equi Nall. It's one of the largest sites at the Paynes Creek Saltworks. Here you see a drone image by Eddie Weeks that was taken on a former um, NSF project in 2011, uh, when drones were really just getting started. There's our boat and there's a huge tarp to catch the, the drone um, when it fell from the sky eventually. So it wasn't a very sophisticated one, but we got great photos. So we don't actually know the limits of the site. And you can see that it's not visible. 
Site's not visible from this picture. The depth of the water is from about one meter to five meters, perhaps more in the steeper part of the channel. So during the last three years since we did our field work season one in, in 2019, I've had time to reflect during the pandemic. And I've thought more about what is a site and what is a basic unit of Maya sites? We often talk, Maya archeologists often talk about plazuela groups or uh, house plaza groups as a basic unit, a household perhaps. And this is a site here, this map, site 74. It has two buildings, building A and building B, and a plaza or yard defined by palmetto palm posts on this side and this side and artifacts associated with this that are not mapped on this, on this map. Um, so here's a site, maybe it's a plazuela group, but we could look at um, the individual site, or we could look at individual buildings as a unit of analysis, or the individual post or the artifact. So I thought maybe we could vary the unit of analysis from looking at um, just sites. So going from sites to building. So let's go back to Equinal in this general area. Maybe the buildings had different construction dates. Maybe they had different uses. Here is the map of Equinal site that has uh, colorful stars representing diagnostic artifacts of uh, Pink or chert, groundstone, pottery is starred in turquoise, obsidian, and other artifacts. And you can see there are clusters. Um, we gave them building names, building A to J. The jadeite gouge was found in building J. We're looking forward to excavating to see if it's a salt work or if it's a residence or, or what's going on with that nice jadeite gouge found there. And here you can see they're distinctly separated. So since we had post samples in the archaeology lab uh, from a previous project that had been desalinated, and we continued with the help of student workers to change the water, we call it artifact conservation, uh, we could radiocarbon date each building. This was a pandemic project in the LSU archaeology lab. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get early access to uh, the labs in May of 2020 after LSU had closed. And I figured out a system for keeping us all healthy and safe. And uh, Corey and I used funds from our grant to uh, select radiocarbon samples to date each of the buildings. Um, and we hope we had hoped to go back the next year in 2021, uh, but now our project, we're going back in 2022, and then we'll continue in 2023. So what do we find? Well, we took post samples from the, um, from the different buildings, and we found that Despite the fact that from the sea floor, the buildings look like they date to the same time period. We're just seeing the tops of the posts, but they're not actually the tops of the buildings or doesn't show when, uh, how deep the posts go into the ground. We haven't done that yet. Um, they only, they're cut off by the um, decay of the wood once it protrudes above the sea floor. And so we found actually that there was a there are four phases of building construction from the late classic to the terminal classic and going a bit into the early post classic, at least in the range, the two sigma range of the radiocarbon samples. And you can see here that most of the buildings date to phase three, which is 
pretty solidly in the terminal classic. If you look at our, and we published this information, and we uh, rewrote, Corey and I wrote an article, which you can get freely online, Bricotage and Brine, Living and Working at the Equinol Saltworks Belize in Ancient Mesoamerica. I have to thank Nan Gonlin, Nan Gonlin, the editor, for getting a much better title than what we had for the article. Um, but um, there's more information on the pottery, for example, that some of my colleagues would be interested in that are found with uh, the building. Some of the uh, Belize red and uh, Wari red unit stamp pottery and other pottery that is in minor amounts that might uh, that might help us date them. But the radiocarbon dates show the construction ages. And so now uh, what we're doing is looking again at the salt works in terms of dating individual buildings and looking at their function to, to try to figure out ultimately the contribution of salt, either as loose salt or as salt cakes uh, to the Maya over time. Because clearly the initial radiocarbon dating of one site per, one sample per site, which I reported in Maya Salt Works, uh, really just showed uh, a massive, uh, 44 of the sites were occupied from the somewhere in the late classic to terminal classic. So we're really refining this. And I have to say, we have an article <clears throat> that's been accepted for Antiquity Magazine that um, <clears throat> in which we, um, we have some even more exciting <clears throat> information uh, about our 2019 excavations at Tabnuk Na in another arm of the lagoon system that's um, also a large site with at least 10 uh, wooden buildings. It has more posts. It has over 600 wooden posts. Uh, so look for that uh, in the future coming up. Uh, this is really the summary information. We came up with expectations of what we would find, what we should find for different types of activities and then looked at the different phases from phase one in the late classic um, <clears throat> into the phase three in the terminal classic and saw that we have some that are salt kitchens, which have massive amounts of bricotage. Some that may be houses that really don't have bricotage. Some of them are clearly related to salting fish. We have no bones, we have no fish bones, uh, but I'll show you in a, in a minute why we think they were salting fish. Uh, so there's multiple different activities that were represented and it really underscores that <clears throat> the unit of analysis, our individual, our clusters of posts and associated artifacts that are separated by at least 10 meters from another such cluster, that's not a household. It's not, it might in some cases be, but it's not necessarily a household or um, a production area that we really need to look at the individual building to figure out uh, <clears throat> the structure of activities and the time of use of these buildings. So uh, in some areas it's, the chert is mostly about fish. Uh, my colleague Kazuo Ioama, who some of you know, is the leading expert on useware of stone tools in the Maya area, uh, analyzed a sample of the stone tools from an earlier project, and some of them are from Equinal. And he determined, for example, building A and building D here the edges show uh, that they were used for cutting fish or meat. And there are some like building B where uh, a minority of them were used for cutting post. Now with all this wood being cut, I figured that most of the stone tools were going to be uh, showing evidence of use where of, of cutting the posts, cutting the trees down and then sharpening the ends. But, um, 
that was not the case. So cutting or scraping uh, fish or meat, such perhaps as manatee or deer or peccary or crocodile, all animals in addition to a plethora of fish which are available in these coastal waters. And as uh, Ben said, I had the great <clears throat> privilege and honor of being interviewed <clears throat> by Ira Flato on uh, Science Friday, and it's still on their uh, NPR website. I checked that out, and uh, he's a great interviewer. Uh, one of my doctoral students, Holly Lincoln, is going to be excavating these buildings to look more at the use of chert, and she'll also look at the chert from the other buildings that some of the rest of us will be excavating. So we're pretty excited about that. But where's the fish? Well, <clears throat> the mangrove peat is a great medium for our matrix for preserving organic material made of plants, like trees and calabash and seeds and nuts, but it's highly acidic and eats away at anything with calcium carbonate. So we have no bones. And even uh, samples that we took from some shell middens, there was no calcium carbonate left to do uh, oxygen isotopes. And my colleague, Barun Sam Gupta, looked at sediment for forams and ostracods, and there, there were none that he could find. And so <clears throat> we think they've, there's just no evidence for them but we have this other kinds of evidence. With the chert, it was interesting, I think, that the stone tools, the morphology, the shape, is not an indicator of how they were used. So we have stemmed points that were used for cutting fish or meat and also for scraping and also for uh, woodworking. Uh, and each of the tools had multiple areas of use wear used for different activities. Uh, and interestingly, even though this chert is all discolored gray from the saltwater mangrove matrix, uh, some of it is uh, from the Northern Belize uh, coal hot chert bearing zone. So the salt workers had long uh, distance connections to Northern Belize, which is quite far away from where we are. Uh, we're going to be using a lot of this, these techniques that we've used in the past, including uh, diving in the deeper areas of Equinol with the airline system of hoses from a gas powered compressor to excavate underwater, basically to be able to stay down. How long can you dive down even six feet and do anything underwater without um, taking a breath? So this was really a game changer for us and it's really low tech. Everybody has to be scuba certified. That's, um, that's my rule. Uh, it's really gas uh, efficient, uh, which is really good in, in these days of high gas prices. Uh, in shallow areas, we'll be using our traditional system of setting up <clears throat> a long PVC pipe and measuring it and moving our metal grid from unit to unit to excavate long transect excavations through the, through the buildings, and then putting the mangrove peat in marine transport devices on a pulley system to an offshore screening station. Here you see the excavations in the background and uh, the screening station here. And uh, here's one of our deep water sites with uh, Dr. Sills and me uh, working at. So we're gonna be using uh, some of these techniques. Uh, I, um, if you wanna hear more about the project, <clears throat> on May 19th, I'm gonna be giving an archeology span abridged part two using 3D technology for the underwater Maya, uh, where we scan, we sometimes print, and uh, we're taking scanners uh, to Belize to, to scan some things. So I'll be uh, zooming uh, in from Belize. I have to acknowledge the National Science Foundation, the initial map that most of this research is based on, uh, the current grant with Dr. Sills and me, uh, permits from the Institute of Archaeology, 
Louisiana State University and now University of Texas at Tyler, where Corey is. The field team uh, tied the Toledo Institute for Development and the Environment, our host family in Belize, John Spang and Tanya Russ, and now their daughter, Lyra, and many friends in Punta Gorda, among others. And uh, I appreciate you listening to my talk. I'm going to uh, end it now. All right. Thank you, Heather. Um, we have about 20 minutes for questions, and there are quite a few of them. So I'm going to get to as many as I can. Um, Heather, how did you, how and why did you first get interested in my salt making? Before I was interested in my salt making, well, first of all, I live in Louisiana and everyone uh, really likes salt. And you, you, you can't have enough salt here in Louisiana, which may, may be a problem, but I've been interested in coastal archeology span since I, I was doing my master's work uh, at Trent University in Canada. And I, um, I've always worked on the coast and I was mainly interested in coastal trade. But when we, after I did my dissertation and we had been working on trading sites, my, my former advisor, uh, Dr. Barbara Voris said, well, what about sites in the area? And I, like, I couldn't do that for my dissertation. But afterwards, we did boat survey looking and found uh, there were sites um, that were submerged and sites that were underwater. And we started looking anywhere in shallow water and found those, those salt making sites, but it wasn't clear to me at first what they were. So it was by doing a lot of background research and comparative research and, and particularly ethnographic research that we discovered that that was the brine boiling. And then I realized, wow, this is a whole new dimension to the trade, which had I've been principally focused on a long distance trading port of Wild Kanki, but this was coastal inland trade of salt during the height of the classic Maya. And so this was a whole new exciting uh, area and uh, it involves swimming in the water. And, you know, that was, that was pretty good. Um, so there are questions about the salt trade technology and the wooden posts themselves. So let's start keeping in that, just sort of going from what you just said. Uh, what is known about how the salt was traded or transported inland? And there's a, a common question that says, is there evidence of sock base or other roads leading inland from the salt works? Okay, so the evidence, I, I wrote an article, well, some of the evidence uh, or my hypotheses and models for how for inland trade of salt uh, are in my book, Maya Salt Works. And also I wrote an article in Journal of Anthropological Archaeology about salt trade and making salt cakes and the size of the salt cakes and the estimates based on ethnographic analogy with Sacapolis and other places. Uh, but because we have the canoe paddle and fragments of other canoe paddles and a kind of beat up broken canoe at the Eleanor Betty site and there were on the water, they would have had to travel on the water to get wooden posts from various places in uh, the rainforest and elsewhere. And there's available rivers that lead inland to uh, near, uh, near or right at inland sites like Lubentun up the Rio Grande. Nimali Panit can be accessed nearby the Golden Stream and other rivers that are, are right nearby that they were clearly transporting things by, by boat and they were probably bringing things back as ballast, as trade items that, that they needed. Um, okay. Um, techniques now. Uh, a couple of questions about when you're using the RFDs, what is the water like when, when, when you're doing those surveys? How deep is the water? Yeah. Well, um, when we're floating, the these this is shallow. So the RFDs, uh, you're floating, and the idea is you just want uh, most of the lagoon system is really shallow water. And if you know anybody who's done uh, shallow underwater archaeology, which has been done a lot in Europe, one of the most difficult things is getting away from what you're studying, what you're trying to map or excavate. 
And so that provides, the RFDs provide us that barrier and distance to be able to float and not destroy, but also uh, see things and map. But if it's deeper water, uh, we can't use them. And so we've been uh, just sort of swimming along. And then when we found the technique with the, with the airline system of hoses from the gas powered compressor, um, that's when we started looking in deeper water. And they've used that, for example, Texas A&M used it in Jamaica to excavate um, uh, the submerged uh, former city there in the harbor. So it's quite a common technique. Have you used anything like side scanning, uh, side scan sonar or uh, any other sort of remote sensing methods uh, in addition? Yes, we have. Uh, we in 2011, I uh, had um, we. I have a colleague who uh, Harry Roberts, who had his tech Eddie design a uh, automated research vessel with side scan sonar in it, and uh, we did sonar of the lagoon system. But uh, because of the the silt covering the sea floor it picked up the silt and anything that protruded from the silt. So there are some shell middens and things that protruded. Um, it did pick up the posts when, because we, we pulled it over some of the areas that had posts that were mapped and we could see it and it was really fabulous. But um, we've also um, got some, uh, participated in a program of um, uh, LIDAR. And for that, we're principally looking at what could be on the mainland? Um, questions about the posts themselves. So, uh, actually, before we get to that, uh, a couple of people have asked: uh, Was the sea? What was the sea level uh, like back then compared to what it is like today? That's an interesting question. Sea level rise. Sea level has risen. Um, a lot since the end of the ice age. The barrier reef system was created. The wonderful place where people tourists go and we all love was was land from the coast out to the barrier reef at the end of the ice age. So it was during the Holocene after the glaciers retreated and the water um, started rising and the inshore lagoon system was flooded that as much as 10 meters of mangrove peat was deposited there. And we have quite a lot of mangrove peat in the uh, in the lagoon system. Uh, it's a current project with uh, Karen McKee, a mangrove ecologist we're working on uh, the sea level changes. But I have a doctoral student, Cher Foster, who is uh, looking at that question in more detail in relation to uh, Tabanukna. And this year, she's going to be doing further dissertation work at Ekwe Nal, trying to address sea level rise, because sea level rise rose before the sites were, were occupied and has continued to rise. And so we have some areas where, you know, even into uh, uh, after into the colonial times that sea level is rising, but um, it's uh, the sites, the communities, the salt uh, making communities were constructed in close to the shore of this coastal lagoon system so they could access the salty water. And so they were really in these low lying areas are really subject to flooding and they may have actually receded. I came up with the idea because we have lines of salt making sites. Uh, there's some maps in my Maya salt workbook about that. So that's a possibility that they move back as the sea level rose, but they were you know, it is kind of a sobering reminder for low-lying places like New Orleans and Belize City uh, today that uh, sea level just is quiet. Sea level rise is quiet, but continues on and uh, really can flood large areas quickly. Um, you, you mentioned that the canoe was Sapadilla wood. What are the posts? What kind of wood are they using for posts? Um, I had a doctoral student, uh, Mark Robinson, identify a lot of the posts, and there's an article in a couple of articles, but there's one, um, you can find the reference, it's in um, Economic Botany, but you can, or actually Journal of Archaeological Science, that one, um, and I've got some information in my Maya Saltworks book, 
there are several ecosystems, the mangrove uh, ecosystem of the, the lagoon system. And I gave a paper remotely uh, at the SAA last week uh, about uh, the use of mangrove wood. And we found that red mangrove was not used for posts, but uh, white mangrove and black mangrove, which are not the ones that grow right in the water, uh, were used, uh, but for a minor amount of them. A surprising number percentage of the wooden posts overall in the lagoon system or at the salt works were, um, were brought from the deciduous hardwood forest, which is um, on the uh, just west of the deep river. So they, they would have had to travel a mile or so to get it and bring, bring this back. So they were, and the pine savanna, which is nearby, which has pine and oak. We don't have any pine, we don't have any oak. Then, mm -hmm. um, so they were clearly selecting what they wanted. And we, we didn't see changes over time in, in the use, uh, certainly of mangrove wood, um, and certainly in the, the dimensions of the posts, the, how big they were, uh, they, there weren't uh, changes over time. But that's uh, we're, something that we're gonna be working on because uh, we, we can't just lump everything together, date one site at a particular time. We've gotta date the, the posts the buildings and then those posts uh, see what the changes of the wood are, but um, they were using a lot of hardwoods. Yeah. Uh, a couple of questions people have asked about the pots themselves. Um, the pots that were used for boiling, for cooking the salt water, was that their only use or were they used for any other types of cooking? And why did they have to be broken to free the salt cakes? Oh, good questions. Well, we have, um, for example, uh, at Site 74, which I showed a map of, there's, there's uh, two buildings there. And Building A, uh, we excavated a, a transect through the building and out each end. And we found a lot of, a lot of artifacts, but nine, and we excavated in 10 centimeter levels with sharp kitchen knives. And so it's really easy to be do stratigraphic excavations in mangrove peat. It's not just it's not sand and it's not mud. And we found 98% of the artifacts were bricketage, were salt making artifacts. And so the activity was boiling brine. So we found the pot legs and we found the broken pots and so forth. And so it's by the the changes in abundance. And certainly these things could have been used. But uh, for example, at uh, Tabnik Na, I reported uh, at the AAA, we had our, our team had a, a session in person in Baltimore at the AAA. Um, and we hope to come to the submit a session for the AIA. So watch for us there. But um, one building, we think building B, which is <clears throat> a house, there wasn't any bricketage. So we think at least there, the bricketage was used for uh, boiling the brine. Why did they break it? Well, we have uh, jars and we have open bowls like the ones that were shown in the picture from Sacropolis, the ethnographic example. And then we have vertical wall basins. We don't know what the base looked like, but the, the walls are vertically and they're all smooth on the inside and rough on the outside. Uh, rough probably to hold them smooth because they want to be able to get the salt out. Why break them? Um, I think just because the salt would adhere to uh, to the sides of it, but I think it's that's an indicator, and I, I suggested this in my uh, Journal of Archaeological Research article that uh, if you had um, if they transported the salt cakes in the pots, then that's an expectation at inland sites that you might find the broken the broken pots um, and. Uh, Cynthia Robin actually uh, found a whole lot of what she thinks are the broken salt pots at Aventura in, in an excavation. And she has a reference to that in, a, in an article she wrote in Research Reports in Belizean Archaeology. Uh, so I think, you know, there's lots of work to be done there. Uh, they do at Sacopolis take uh, cornmeal and, and put it on the inside walls of the pots before they add the brine. And I think that's 
to create a nice smooth surface, but it may also to be to uh, stop them from adhering so much. And we found uh, monosomatates at our salt sites. So, you know, they could have been used in the residences, they, but they also have a function for the salt making. Right. It's a long answer to that. Yeah, I, yeah, but, but also, are they making the pots locally or is it, are they getting them from somewhere? Uh, that's, uh, that's a very good question. Another one of my graduate students uh, just finished, just defended and later this afternoon, I'm going to read the final edits <laughs> before she submits to the grad school, uh, uh, looking at the brine boiling pots. And she did a, a variety of analyses of them, but um, we think uh, they appear to be locally made. We also have, uh, from one of the sites, we have a pottery making paddle, a wooden paddle, such that you, I mean, I've seen them ethnographically at salt making sites and other, other sites. Um, and the, the, the um, temper is quartz and it's available in the, you know, from bringing the stuff down from the Maya mountains. But we've actually got deposits of, of um, sand and deposits of clay that are in the, in the lagoon below the sea floor uh, that would have been the remains of some previous uh, um, water direction of one of the, the rivers. This is a huge deltaic system between yeah. the deep river and the monkey river. And uh, those branches may have changed courses. So we think that it was, it was locally, but that's uh, part of Rihanna's uh, thesis. And she's got a journal manuscript ready almost to go. And, uh, and ongoing research. We've got a, a colleague doing some uh, thin section and petrography. We have time for one more question, Heather. Uh, and this is, of course, everybody wants to know, what kind of risks, what kind of wildlife, insects, are they snakes in the water? What are the dangers that you and your team are facing on a daily basis to get us this incredible information about the ancient Maya? I have to say, uh, it's a really safe place to go and really looking forward to us returning because it's remote. We're going to be remote and isolated. Those are the key words that I, I, I wrote in my justification to LSU to allow us to go back and do the research. We're going to be away from other people. There's no other people living in the area. So first of all, that's really good. But we are really careful about safety because we're isolated. We go 15 miles north of Punta Gorda and we live with our host family uh, and there's no roads. It's only boat travel. So our boat driver stays with us and we go into town when he goes into town. Uh, we go out uh, by boat another 15 miles farther north to Paines Creek National Park, which is the lagoon system. But as you saw on those, the photos I showed of the water, there's nobody there. There are rangers there, but their ranger station is up in the pine savanna. So we're really isolated uh, and, um, and we're careful about things. So dangers, where we live is infested with all kinds of biting insects, all the things that, you know, if you read old stories by John Eric S. Thompson about, you know, uh, bot flies and, and things like that, but, uh, sand flies and mosquitoes and doctor flies and tarantulas and scorpions and so forth. But we cover up and, and we get immune to those. But once we leave the dock and go to the lagoon, there are no insects, a few killer bees here and there, but uh, they don't bother us. Yeah. And, and I do have a site named killer bee though. And then um, there are snakes. There's lots of things where we, where we stay, but uh, in the water um, we have, on our research flotation devices, looking on the seafloor, followed the trail of jaguar paw prints in the water. Jaguars, oh. like other cats, can yeah. swim, but they're not interested in us. And that's what we found with most of the wildlife there. There's no people, they're, there's, they're not tourists, there's not houses there that are uh, infringing on their territory. There's lots of um, 
of um, fish. It's one of the best fly fishing areas in the world for permit. There's a high-end fishing lodge just outside of Punta Gorda. Michael Coe has been to our lake. He went fly fishing. So, uh, you know, not many archaeologists have come to visit us. Uh, not many people have come to visit yeah. us. Uh, so there are some dangers, and we're certainly very aware. We have cell phones, so we we call. No one can call us, but we can call out. We did. We made a lot of radio checks. Having carried out research, even on more remote areas, camping out on Wild Can Key and camping out on Frenchman's Key um, since um, 1982 in field work, become very conscious of safety as a primary consideration and. We don't have problems. We're careful. Yeah. It's a lot of fun too. Well, I, uh, I mean, hopefully we can change that and we can all come and visit at some point. I would love to come and see you in action. But Heather, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We wish you the best on the upcoming field season. I'm looking forward to the follow-up on May 19th. So to everybody who's listening, remember Heather's giving us a second talk on May 19th, same time. Uh, Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. Uh, and, and the link, we will send it out uh, to everybody as well uh, to, to, so that you can register for the talk. Heather, thank you. Amber, Adrian, thank you for the ASL interpretation. And thank you all for tuning in to uh, for another episode of Archaeology Abridged. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, thank you. Ben. Thank you, Adrian and Amber and everybody else. It was really a, a great pleasure for me to share the research. And thanks for everybody for tuning in. Bye, everybody. Bye.